for Dajjal. Let us big, begin with definition. Dajjal is a being, a wujud. Dajjal was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created him in his wisdom. And when Allah created Dajjal, Allah endowed Dajjal with awesome power, with awesome versatility. And Dajjal was created at that time when Adam alayhi salam was created. Because the Prophet said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, every Prophet has warned his people about Dajjal. Every Prophet. So the Jal has been created a long, 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 long time ago. In the last age, the Jal will be released. <coughs> and when he is released on earth, the Jal will have a general mission and he will have a specific mission. His general mission is to test all of mankind, to test you, to see whether you have any faith at all. All those who fail his test are heading for the fire. His test will be an awesomely difficult test. So great will be the tests and trials to which mankind will be subjected by Dajjal. Then the Prophet said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, the greatest fitna, fitna means a test and a trial, he said, the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day is the fitna of Dajjal. So don't play around with this subject. Be very serious with this subject. Dajjal will not only test all of mankind and tonight we will look at some of the tests. But Dajjal has a specific mission. His mission is to impersonate Al-Masih and to get Banu Israel to believe that he is Al-Masih. And so in order to understand Dajjal in his capacity as Al-Masih al-Dajjal, we need first to understand who or what is Al-Masih? After Banu Israel had lived in the Holy Land, which Allah had given to them, and after Dawood alayhi salam had established the state of Israel, he was a Muslim, so this is the Islamic state of Israel. And after Suleiman alayhi salam had raised it until it became, became the most magnificent state that history will ever witness. After Suleiman alayhi salam had built the masjid, and therefore, after Banu Israel had experienced, take note of this, after Banu Israel had experienced the Golden Age, then they committed misdeeds 
they violated the trust with Allah, the covenant with Allah. They committed many, many sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled them from the Holy Land. Surah to Bani Israel of the Quran, Surah number 17, describes this. وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ يعني الأرض المقدسة لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعَلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا Twice did Banu Israel commit fasad in the Holy Land. Fasad is not just corruption. Fasad is a corruption which is destructive in nature. Hmm? What did they do? We don't have the time tonight. But if I get a chance to deliver the lecture Jerusalem in the Quran, then we can go into all those details. But they were expelled. They had violated the conditions for residence in the Holy Land. And Allah sent a Babylonian army. And that Babylonian army destroyed the state of Israel, destroyed the masjid, and took Banu Israel into slavery in Babylon. Babylon is in today's modern day Iraq, in that territory. All right. And so the golden age has come to an end. While Banu Israel were there in Babylon, weeping, weeping by the rivers of Babylon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets to them. Among the prophets was a prophet named Daniel, for example. And he's a very important figure, Daniel. When these prophets came to Banu Israel in Babylon, these prophets communicated to Banu Israel a promise from Allah to them. The promise was that he was going to send to them a prophet who would be a special prophet because this prophet would bring back the golden age. The golden age was one in which Suleiman alayhi salam and the state of Israel ruled the world. It was the ruling state of the world. And when this prophet comes, he will bring that back. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. This prophet, special prophet to Banu Israel, this prophet was known as Al-Masih. The meaning of the word is not relevant here. The significance of the word is what is relevant. The functions of Al-Masih is to bring back the golden age, to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order for the Messiah to bring back the golden age, the implication is number one, this is clear as an implication, number one, he would first have to liberate the Holy Land from Gentile rule, non-Jewish rule. Number two, he would have to bring Badu Israel back to the Holy Land. Number three, he will have to restore the state of Israel. And number four, that Israel must grow until it becomes the ruling state in the world. And that Messiah must rule the world from Jerusalem. Only then will the golden age of Suleiman alayhi salam return.
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise and sent the Messiah, Al-Masih, in the person of Isa alayhi salam, they rejected him. Is it tomorrow night? No, Thursday night we have Islamic view of the return of Isa alayhi salam. Thursday night. So on Thursday night we're going to go into this in greater detail. Hmm? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise, and sent the Messiah to them, they rejected him. Not all. No, no, no. There were some Jews who accepted him. But there are others who rejected him. They rejected him because they declared that he's a bastard. His mother gave birth to him without a father. Without any sorry, husband. And therefore she had committed that vile deed of zina. She's a bastard. A bastard cannot be the Messiah. So they rejected him. And then later on, when they saw him die on the cross, before their very eyes they saw him die, it was now confirmed that although he himself claimed that he was the Messiah and although there were many Jews who believed in him as the Messiah the rabbis had rejected him it was now confirmed he could not have been the Messiah why? number one he's dead but the Holy Land has not been liberated it is still under Roman rule Number two, he's dead. But the state of Israel has not been restored. Number three, he's dead. But the state of Israel has not risen to become the ruling state in the world. And he has not ruled the world from Jerusalem. Huh? A number of reasons. So he could not have been the Messiah. Tomorrow night or Thursday night I'll give you some more reasons. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. What they did not know, and you and I know, is that this was indeed Al-Masih. And when they thought that he was dead, that they had crucified him, no, he was not crucified. Allah made it appear unto them that he was crucified. And Allah raised him unto himself. So he did not experience something called mouth, mouth. And since every soul must taste mouth, who said so? Every soul must taste mouth, who said so? Yes, the Quran. Allah says so. Kullu nafsin za'ikatul mouth. Every soul must taste mouth. Therefore, he also must taste mouth. Therefore, he will return, he will die. Since they're still waiting for Al-Masih to come, you can't live in New York and not know that. Still, they're still waiting for Al-Masih to come. And they had boasted of how they killed this one. The Prophet Muhammad والسلام, informed us that Allah will send in the last days this being created by Allah who will impersonate Al-Masih and who will convince them that he is delivering the return of the golden age. He will deceive them however because he would not be the true Messiah. He will deceive them because this would not be the return of the golden age. It would appear like that. And so Dajjal has been endowed with awesome powers of 
deception. He has a PhD in deception. Dajjal. This is indeed the meaning of the word itself. Dajjal. If the Jal is to deceive Banu Israel and get them to be convinced that he is the Messiah, look at what he will have to do. Number one, he will have to liberate the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule. Number two, He'll have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land. No matter how long they had lived outside of the Holy Land, he'll have to bring them back. Number three, he will have to restore the state of Israel. And number four, number four, he will have to take the state of Israel to that status where it will become the ruling state in the world. And he himself will then have to rule the world from Jerusalem. That's not an easy task at all for the Jal to perform. Hmm? When you give, make sure you put your hands deep in the pockets and give something inshallah for the masjid. Now let's come to the first hadith. The very few I'm going to quote, but the very important. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, and it is perhaps the most important of the hadith I'm going to quote tonight. This one. He said, when the Jal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day, like a year. One day, like a month. One day, like a week. And the rest of his days, like your days. When his day is like our day, he will be in our dimension of time. But prior to that, he would not be in our dimension of time because his day would not be like our day. When he is in our dimension of time, at that time it will be possible for us to see him. At that time, he will appear as a human being. A human being, not a system, not a civilization, a human being. And he would be a Jew. And he would be a young man powerfully built, with curly hair. At that time, when he appears in the world, in our dimension of time, the Prophet said, والسلام, he will come from the east. He pointed his finger 20 times to the east. The Jal will come from the east. But what about prior to that, when he will not be in our dimension of time. Where will he be, for example, when, when his day is like a year? 
Where will he be? Do we have any answer to that? He's going to be on earth. But we won't be able to see him. The angels, are they here in this room? Yes. How many? Each one of you have two angels on your forehead, on your shoulders. So there are many angels right here in this room. They are on earth. Are they in our dimension of time? No. No, no, no. So they don't perform salat according to our timetable. Huh? Fajr. For them is not Fajr for us. Hmm? If we were to go into that day in which they live, and we have to perform salat, can we perform salat according to this timetable? No, we don't have to calculate to do it. Hmm? Can an angel come into our world? Can an angel come into our dimension of time so we can see the angel? Huh? Huh? Yes, which one? Yes, Jibra'il alayhi salam. Came as a human being, right in the masjid. Are there jinn in this masjid now? Oh yes, they are. They are not. Can we see them? Are they in our dimension of time? No, they're not. But can they enter into our dimension of time? Yes. Mr. Shaitan himself, Iblis. He came as a human being, as an old man, you remember, with a walking stick. So Dajjal will enter into our dimension of time one day. We see him. But prior to that, in a day which is like a year, where will he be? It is from that location that he will commence his attack. He will begin his effort. Number one, to liberate the Holy Land. Number two, to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. Number three, to restore the state of Israel. Number four, you know what's number four. From that location he will begin the, the, the effort. Where will it be? Fortunately for us, we have the answer. And it is also in Sahih Muslim. It is known as the Hadith of Tamim al-Dari. Listen to it carefully now. Tamim al-Dari was a Christian who took the Shahada, became a Muslim in Medina. He came to the Prophet والسلام, and narrated an experience which he had. The Prophet والسلام, after the Salat in the Masjid asked the people, sit down, sit down. I have something to tell you. Tamim al-Dari has come to me and told me something about Dajjal which confirms what I have been saying to you. So we know that what is contained in this story is true. What did Tamim al-Dari experience? He said that he and some 40 of his companions went on board a ship. So you need water, eh? So they have to go in some place where you can travel with a ship, a sea or an ocean. And when they went on board the ship, a storm came. And the storm blew the ship for 40 days before, no, no, for a whole month, sorry, not 40 days. The storm blew the ship for a whole month before they reached land. Now if you are on the western side of Arabia, which is Hijaz, and you get on board a ship, there are only two, two seas on which you can travel. One is the Mediterranean Sea, 
and the other is the Red Sea. What are these two? But it seems very much unlikely, <laughs> in fact impossible, for a ship to be in the Red Sea and for a storm to be blowing and that that ship did not touch land for a whole month because the Red Sea is very narrow. And so I have chosen to eliminate the Red Sea and I have chosen to remain with only the Mediterranean Sea. After they reached land, then they got off the ship onto a boat and they went and it was an island. And on the island they saw a strange beast. It was very hairy, so hairy, so much hair that you could hardly distinguish the head from the tail. So this beast is concealing its identity. And the beast spoke and said that I am, what? Huh? I am? Are you guessing that? I am Jassas. Jassas means a spy. A spy. So this is number one, an island about one month's journey from the western side of Arabia. Number two, this is an island which conceals its true identity. Number three, this is an island of those who have PhDs in spying, in espionage, huh? in intelligence work. Jesus then said to them, there is someone waiting to see you over there at the monastery, Christian monastery. So this is a Christian island. When they went to the monastery, they found this young man powerfully built hmm, here, but he was in chains, his hand chained to his neck, his legs chained, and this man started to question them, a number of questions. Uh, the Nabi al-Ummi, has he arrived in Medina? Nabi al-Ummi means, it doesn't, doesn't mean the Nabi who cannot read and write, no. It means the Nabi who is not a Jew, the Nabi who is Gentile. Has he arrived in Medina? Yes, he has. Are the people accepting him? Some are accepting, some are not. This man then says, it will be to their benefit if they will follow him. A very important statement. Then he asked, the, the date plantations of a particular area, is the crop still coming out in abundance? They said yes. He said, I don't think it will last for long. And then he asked, Buhayratu Tabariya, that's the Arabic name. The English name is the Sea of Galilee. The Jews call it Lake Kinneret. It is the largest sea in the Holy Land. It is from the Sea of Galilee that that whole of the Holy Land gets water. The Sea of Galilee. He said, is there any water in the Sea of Galilee? They said, yes, plenty water. He said, I don't think it's going to last for long. And then he said, I am Dajjal. I am Dajjal. And when I am released, I'm going to enter every single town and city. But notice, he didn't say Kampung. <laughs> <laughs> he said, when I am released, I'm going to enter every town and city. 
except Mecca and Medina because the angels will bar me which means at the time when the Jah's day will be like our day and he appears in the world as a human being at that time he cannot enter Mecca and Medina the angels will guard him now then we now know from this hadith that when Dajjal is released and commences his mission, he will commence his mission from this island. Which island is it? In 1917, the British Secretary of State was a man named Lord Balfour. And Lord Balfour made a declaration a stunning declaration. Britain was the superpower in the world and Lord Balfour declared that the British government intends to pursue an effort for the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. In 1919, a British general led an army which defeated the Turkish army and from a Jewish perspective liberated Jerusalem and liberated the Holy Land and then Britain became the power which controlled the Holy Land the League of, in those days you didn't have the United Nations, you had the League of Nations. And the League of Nations conferred upon Britain something called mandate power. So Britain was the mandate power who controlled the Holy Land. Britain controlled the Holy Land from 1919 until 19. 48. In 1948, Britain acted as the midwife for the baby to be born. The baby, of course, was the state of Israel. In consequence of all of this, I have come to the conclusion that the island was Britain. And so when the Jal was released and commenced his mission to deceive Banu Israel and to deliver to them what would appear to be the return of the Golden Age, it is from Britain that he commenced his mission. But if there's anyone who differs with me, then I'll have to invite them to tell me you tell me which island it is. You cannot just defer with me without telling me which island is it. Because the hadith is there in Sahih Muslim. You've got to deal with the hadith. During the time that the Jal was launching his attack from Britain, the Holy Land was liberated of non-Jewish rule. During the time that Britain was hosting the Jal, the Jews came back to the Holy Land. And during the time that the Jal was launching his attack from Britain, the state of Israel was restored. Three out of four already delivered. And in all of this, the overwhelming majority of Jews have been absolutely convinced that all of this represents blessings from Allah. That Allah is validating the Jewish claim to truth that Allah is fulfilling his promise to Banu Israel. Now comes a little more difficult part. 
it was fairly simple to identify the island of Britain. If when the Jal was in a day which lasts like a year, he will be in an island according to the hadith of Tamim Dari. Where will he be in a day which is like a month? Is he going to move to another territory? And if he moves to another territory, how can we recognize it? The yardstick which I use to measure whether or not the Jal has moved to another territory in a day which is like a month is the yardstick of the state of Israel. Who is the one who is keeping it alive? Who is the one who is conferring upon it security? Who is the one who is building it up constantly? Feeding it, feeding it, and making it stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Is it Britain? The answer is no. Remember, your brother Imran is also a student of international relations. Don't forget that. The answer is no. Someone else has taken over from Britain as the strategic ally of the state of Israel. Britain is still there, but now there is someone else more important than Britain with a more strategic relationship. The United States of America is without any question whatsoever the most important strategic ally of the state of Israel in the world today. Without any question whatsoever. The United States of America is the country which is supporting Israel with the greatest amount of financial assistance and material assistance. The United States of America is the country which has a strategic military alliance with the state of Israel. And so I have come to the conclusion that the Dajjal in a day which is like a month is no longer in Britain. Britain now has to give way to another country. Britain was the superpower. Britain was ruling the world. But now another country mysteriously, strangely, inexplicably takes over from Britain as the ruling power in the world and the strategic ally of the state of Israel. This is the United States of America. When did it happen? Now we're going to test your knowledge of international affairs. When did it happen? I think you would agree with me, number one, that the Second World War would be the turning point, clearly. Because in the Second World War, all the Allied troops on the continent of Europe, which were fighting Hitler, were under one command. Was it a British general? Huh? No. Who is it? General? Eisenhower. An American general. And so here is tangible evidence that the United States has now taken over from Britain.
as a senior partner. Evidence number two. At the end of the Second World War, in 1945, the, the international community came together in a conference in Bretton Woods in upstate New York to create a new international monetary system. Prior to this, Britain, London, was the financial capital of the world. Ever since the Bank of England was established maybe 200 years earlier, London was the financial capital of the world. And the ruling currency in the world was the British sterling pound. His Majesty the sterling pound. But now at Bretton Woods, something strange happens. The Bretton Woods Agreement confers upon the U.S. dollar the status of the ruling currency. And the Bretton Woods Agreement confers upon Washington the status of the financial capital of the world because the International Monetary Fund is now located in Washington. The British didn't like that at all. The World Bank is located in Washington. The British didn't like that at all. So here is the second tangible evidence that Britain has now conceded and the United States has now taken over as the ruling power in the world. And then came a third and even more dramatic evidence. In 1952, a revolution took place in Egypt. And the Egyptian king, Farouk, was overthrown by the military. The military put General Muhammad Naguib, or Najib, as the president. But he was like a figurehead, really, because there were a group of officers who really controlled the thing. Muhammad Naguib remained as the president from 1952 until 1956. But in 1955, there was a very important conference of Asian and African states which took place in a city in Indonesia. Which one? Bandung. I was in Bandung two weeks ago. Bandung, water in Ka Bandung, very cold. When you take your bath in the morning, very cold water. At the Bandung conference, it is not Muhammad Naguib who goes to represent Egypt, but rather a man named Gamal Abdel Nasser. That's a sign of who is in charge. The next year, 1956, Gamal Abdel Nasser replaces Muhammad Naguib as the president of Egypt. Shortly after that, same 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal. Who built the Suez Canal? The French. Ferdinand de Lesseps was the French engineer. And then the French and the British came together in a joint control of the Suez Canal. Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal, removes the French and British troops which were there, and Egyptian troops now take control of the Suez Canal. This is as plain and as clear an act of defiance and of confrontation with Britain as you could possibly find. 
in order for Britain to have any vestige of a claim to be a superpower, Britain has to respond, must respond. Well, what Britain did was, strangely, mysteriously, Britain kept the United States out. And the British and the French joined with Israel and these three countries invaded Egypt. They landed in Suez and they took control of Suez. And the Israeli army swept through the Sinai Peninsula and took control of the whole of Sinai. And the Israeli army reached to the Suez Canal. General Dwight Eisenhower said, no, I will not allow this. Go back. Can you tell Britain that? Withdraw your troops, go back. Will Britain obey? Sir Anthony Eden was the British Prime Minister. Guess what Britain had to do? Huh? Britain had to withdraw its troops. And France had to withdraw its troops. And the State of Israel had to withdraw its troops back to Israel. Because the American President said, No, I will not permit it. Go back. So here you have the third, the most dramatic of all evidence that the United States of America has now taken over from Britain as the ruling